Welcome all to this new session, which is going to start chapter 16, Planar Kinematics of Rigid Body. We will discuss three sections, planar, rigid body motion, translation, rotation about fixed axis in two parts. So this is part one, then we will have another part for a problem. So the objectives here is to classify the various types of rigid body motions, to investigate rigid body translation and show how to analyze motion about the fixed axis. The motion of rigid body can be classified into three types, translation, rotation about fixed axis, and general plane motion. Now, before we move on, I want to make sure that you understand what, the, what does it mean to have a rigid body. Now, a rigid body, of course, it's not a particle anymore, so its shape matters. And for that, we just to make it general, we assume that we have a general shape, irregular. Of course, this irregular shape somewhere will have a center of mass, and at that center, we will have the weight acting downward toward the gravity direction. This is going to be mg. Now, when we say that this is a rigid body, we mean that if there are two points, this is point A and this is point B, and this is, for example, the distance between the two. Now, no matter what do we do to the body, we rotate it, we translate it, we rotate it and translate it at the same time, this point will remain at the same distance from the other one. So this is because the, the body is assumed to be rigid, while, if, for example, the body is not rigid, then, then doing any kind of or applying forces act, uh, uh, on it, then that will cause the body to deform, and therefore those the distance between the two points will not remain the same, even the orientation. So this is the meaning of rigid body. The concept of rigid body and its implication can be easily understood by considering translation of rigid body. So here we have two examples. This is one, and this is the other one. In the first one, we have the rigid body. We mark two points right there, and then we translate this rigid body in a rectilinear path and if you remember a rectilinear path is a straight path and if we follow the path at which those points will follow then this path will have a, will be a, a straight line and the other one will be a straight line not only this because the body is is um, is rigid then there is no deformation here or there, and this is why we will get two parallel lines. Similarly, if we move the body in a curved linear path, then we will get two curves which are equally apart at any instant from each other, and this is again because of the rigid body assumption. Now, for the rotation about fixed axis, we have here the, this axis of rotation, and what is really different is that we did not consider this anywhere in the previous chapters because we said that this is a spin and spin is ignored in particles. While here in rigid body we have an axis of rotation and what is interesting is that if you pick any point on the body and then follow its trajectory, then that tra trajectory is going to be a uniform circle as we are going to see next. When we say general blame motion, we actually mean that the body is both translating and rotating. So the body just moved from one point here to another one, and at the same time it was at this orientation, now it moved to that orientation. So this is a mixture of both translation and rotation. We're not going to spend a lot of time here, but this is just an example of a machinery where we have here a piston, here we have a crank, and we have here a wheel, and those are connected, connected by rods. And as you see, this part, which is this crank, is only rotating. So it's a, just a simple rotation about fixed axis. Every single point on the crank will make a circle, as we said. Similarly, the disc here is pinned in the middle, so this is why it's only rotating. While 
This one, as we will see, at one instant, it can be only translating, moving in this direction. While this one is both translating and rotating because of its connection to this one. So this changes across the motion. So we only take one instant and we analyze it as we will see later. So to analyze the translation of rigid body, we assume that this rigid body right here has two points, one point A and this is point B, and it is in motion, okay, toward this direction. Now, as you, if you remember from relative motion, we said that if we have a fixed coordinate system, X and Y, then if we have a position vector pointing from the origin all the way to any point on the rigid body, then RA and RB are considered to be the absolute positions of A and B. While, what are we going to do? The thing which is different here is that we are going to assign a translating coordinate system. And this translating coordinate system is going to be attached to point A. So attaching it to point A or B doesn't matter. But if we have this translating coordinate system at point A, then a vector which is pointing from A, which is now the origin of the translating coordinate system, to B is going to be this relative position vector, which is R, B, with respect to A. Now, if we write down the position equation, then it's going to be R, B, as a vector, equals to R, A, as a vector, plus R, B, with respect to A. Now, let's look at the velocity. For the velocity, we will have d r b over d t, which is equal to d r a over d t plus d r b with respect to a over d t. Now, here, right away, we will have this one as the velocity of b. And this one is going to be the velocity of A. But this one, this one, this part, let me mark it in red, is going to be equals to zero. Why? This is equals to zero. And the reason is that this measure the relative, the change in the relative position between point A and point B. And as we describe, this is a rigid body. So in rigid body, this position vector between A and B will never change. It's always constant. And for that reason, we will have this conclusion that the velocity of B equals to the velocity of A. Now, what you need to remember is one thing. This is only translation. And what we are saying here is that in translation, if you pick any point, even like this point, and you call it point C, then this point C will be, uh, will have the velocity of Z will be equals to the velocity of A will be equals to the velocity of B. Any point in the rigid body will have the same velocity. Now, it's uh, probably very simple to guess that the acceleration A of B is going to be equals to the acceleration of A. Why? Because it's the same. Uh, all points move, as, as, as I wrote here, all points move with the same velocity and acceleration. This is because the relative position vector doesn't change. Now, let's consider rotation about a fixed axis. If we have this rigid body and it is rotating about this line, then if we consider a point P as shown here, 
on the body, on the surface of the body, or even in the interior part, uh, part of the body, it doesn't matter. And then we introduce a rotation. If we introduce a rotation, then basically, if we consider that this is the reference, then the location or the angular position of point P is theta, and it is measured from the reference all the way to here. But by introducing a rotation, we added d theta. So d theta is basically the angular displacement. And by doing that, they will basically say uh, we can actually define the angular velocity as well as the angular acceleration. But let's start one by one. Here we define, as it says, define uh, the angular position defined by the angle theta measured between a fixed reference a line two and r so this is r r is the location of the point on the rigid body from the center of the uh, of the rotation of course the angular position is measured in radian and for the displacement is d theta and the angular displacement is a vector quantity we're going to talk about this in details later and of course it's measured in radian or revolutions and just to remind you that one revolution is equals to two radians. If we know the angular displacement, we can measure the angular velocity. So the angular velocity, which is called omega, is calculated by omega, which is equal to d theta over dt, and taking counterclockwise as positive, because omega is a vector. And if we write it in a scalar form, we need to define which direction is positive. So it's basically the rate of change in angular position. The acceleration, which is called alpha, is equal to the rate of change in angular velocity. So again, counterclockwise is positive. We can write alpha in terms of d2 theta over dt squared. If you remember, when we talk about when we talked about particles, we said that acceleration by ds is equal to velocity dv. Now we can do the same here. We can have this as positive, the angular uh, rotation in or the rotation in the counterclockwise direction is positive, and we replace a with alpha, ds with d theta and v with omega and dv with d omega. We can also write down the equations for constant ac acceleration, but this time for constant angular acceleration. So to do this, we again take counterclockwise as positive, and we say that this is omega equals to omega zero plus alpha c e multiplied by t. Then theta, which is equal to theta zero plus omega zero t plus half alpha c t squared. Then finally, the third equation, omega squared equals to omega zero squared plus two alpha c multiplied by theta minus theta zero. So what did we do here? Let me just make sure that I don't forget the direction of the rotation we basically wrote uh, the following we said we have uh, from the motion of particle we have position s we have velocity we have acceleration and here what did we do we said that you change s with theta, you change v with omega, and you change a with alpha. So if this is constant acceleration relation, instead of having a c, we will have alpha c. Time is still the same. If you remember a few slides back, we discussed translation of rigid body, and we concluded that if we have any two points, then these points will have the same velocity and will have the same acceleration. Now, with rotation, the story is totally different. 
and if we consider here uh, the position of partic uh, of point P on the rigid body, then it can be represented by a position vector R as shown over here. So this is R and this is point P. And if we introduce displacement, then point P will move to here, right? So we can measure this path, the length of this path, using the arc equation. And so let's see how we can calculate the displacement as well as the velocity and acceleration using this definition. So after defining the position of the point on the rigid body right here by r, which is the position vector, then the velocity, I'm going to write it down in a scalar notation. The velocity v is going to be equal to ds over dt. What is s? Is the arc length because this is the amount of displacement the body undergo and uh, and then what we will end up with is that this is d over dt we substitute s which is r theta now we know that r will always be the same because that point over here will make a uniform circle as you see that's the circle so the radius of the circle is always the same, and this is this is why r is always the same. So I don't need to take the derivative with respect to r. And for that, I will end up with d theta over dt multiplied by r, which is a constant. And we know that d theta over dt equals to omega r. So in a vector form, v is equal to omega cross r p which is the position of particle or the uh, the position of point p right here and as we know the velocity is always tangent to the path and since the path is circular the velocity vector will always be perpendicular to r like here now as for the acceleration since point p is moving in a circular path then we can easily guess that there will be a tangential acceleration and there will be a normal acceleration now for the tangential acceleration at it is basically defined as the rate of change of the linear velocity dv over dt which is equal to d over dt r omega now we know that v is omega r we just defined it uh, in the previous slide so this is again equal to r d omega over dt just to remind you that r is constant now this is going to give us alpha r alpha is the angular acceleration by r which is the position now a n is going to be equal to if you remember it is the velocity square over rho. Now, rho here is r. So, this one is rho, which is the radius of curvature. But since we have a circle, and it will always be a circle, then it is automatically substituted as r. So, what we are going to get, let's substitute the velocity, which is omega r, the angular velocity here. Uh, omega multiplied by r this is square over r and what you will get you will get omega square r now if we want to get the magnitude of the acceleration then it is the square root of alpha r square plus omega square r all square which is going to get you r multiplied by alpha square plus omega to the 4. Now let's represent the acceleration using vector notation. Now just to remind you that the velocity is equal to omega cross rp. 
Now, if we take the derivative of this equation, then the acceleration a as a vector equals to dv over dt, which is equal to d omega over dt cross rp plus omega as a vector cross drp over dt. So clearly, what we are going to get here is alpha vector crossed rp plus omega as a vector cross omega cross rp. Now, from where we get this term, this term is the derivative of the position with respect to time which is the velocity, like here, like this one. Now, clearly, what we are going to get here is that a t as a vector equals to alpha cross r p, while a n as a vector is equal to omega cross omega cross r p. Now, what is really important is to note that the result of this product is minus omega square r p as a vector. And now, let's discuss why there is this negative sign. First of all, you should understand that the tangential direction is acting in this way while as we discussed in the normal tangential coordinate the normal coordinate will act always toward the center of the rotation or the center of the radius of curvature however what is really important here is to note that Although the normal component is indeed acting along this direction, but in reality, what we have here is a scalar value, which is omega square, which has no direction, and we have our p as a vector. And if you look carefully, maybe this isn't clear now, but this is the head of the arrow pointing from the center of the rotation to point P. So the direction of R P is actually always in the opposite sense of A N. And for that reason, since this value gain its direction from R P in order to indicate the direction of A N correctly, we have to put the minus sign. Now, finally, and before we end this section, let's talk about very important application of rigid body motion, which is dealing with gears. So gears engaged at one single point right here. And since this point on the two gears is basically considered to be the same, so it has the same kinematic relation in two different gears, then we can write down the equation S, which is the arc length, equals to theta A R A, which is equal to theta B R B. If we take uh, if we take the time derivative, we get V equals to omega A R A, which is equal to omega B R B. We take the time derivative again, we get the acceleration A which is equal to alpha a r a, which is equal to alpha b r b. Now, clearly, the two radii here are constant. They are always the same. This is why we take the time derivative for the angular position. We get the angular acceleration, and then uh, the angular velocity, and then we get the angular acceleration. So this is the end of part one of this session. On part two, we will solve one complete problem about the subject. Thank you.